Now, I have the honor of introducing our final speaker for the day, Franklin Leonard, founder and CEO of The Blacklist. Franklin is a film and television producer, cultural commentator, and entrepreneur. He's the founder and CEO of The Blacklist, the company that celebrates and supports great screenwriting and the writers who do it via film production. More than 400 scripts from the annual Blacklist survey have been produced as feature films earning 250 Academy Award nominations and 50 wins, including Juno, King's Speech, and Argo. Franklin's here to share his perspective on the cost of anti-Black bias in the film industry. Franklin, to you. But thank you much, very much for that kind introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Franklin Leonard. Um, I'm reasonably certain that I'm the least well-known person on the agenda today, so a brief introduction probably makes sense. Uh, I run a company called The Blacklist. It's a web-based company for screenwriters, television writers, producers, agents, studios, and talent that began as an ongoing but rudimentary data study to find the best screenplays in Hollywood. Uh, and notably, for today's purposes, two years ago, Harvard Business School found that controlling for all other factors, movies made from scripts uh, identified by that ongoing study make 90% more in revenue uh, than those made from scripts that aren't. Um, the for-profit company that my team has built since uh, on, builds on that insight and in many ways functions as an industry metal detector in an almost infinite field of haystacks to identify the best writing and best writers in a now global film industry. Um, it is very much a shared value business in its DNA. And if you'd like to learn more, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, but today I'm actually here to talk about other work that I was involved in that incidentally also has to do with systemic failures in value identification, or, or put another way, uh, with people leaving a whole lot of money on the table as a result of bad corporate decision making. And in order to do that, we need to uh, take it back to June 2nd, 2020. Some of you may recognize that as Blackout Tuesday, a week after Derek Chauvin's murder of George Floyd, 81 days after Breonna Taylor was shot and killed in her own home by police, and 100 days after George and Travis McMichael shot Ahmaud Arbery while he was out on a run. Uh, my social channels, and I'm sure many of yours, were filled with Black Instagram titles and corporate solidarity statements with Black Lives Matter, asserting that silence is complicity and that we must all do better, uh, and many other such sentiments. And I have to admit, it was a very surreal experience for me personally. Uh, many of those statements came from Hollywood companies and I found myself unable to ignore the gap between these workshop platitudes that I was seeing on my phone and laptop and the words and actions that I'd experienced daily uh, as a black man working in the industry for the last two decades. Two weeks later, uh, my former employee, Mc employer, McKinsey and Company, they're getting a lot of mention here today, uh, made a substantial pro bono commitment of global work to advance racial equity and economic empowerment among black communities. Um, and I remember thinking, well, if you wanna study inequity and disempowerment, do I have a story for you? And as a representative of a loose assemblage of black Hollywood executives called the Black Light Collective, I reached out and asked them to study the state of black people in Hollywood. Uh, in March of this year, they released that study and it's titled Black Representation in Film and Television, The Challenges and Impact of Increasing Diversity. Now, this, this is a rather anodyne title, but to those paying attention, its findings are rather earth shattering. At its uppermost levels, as, as Dr. Kramer has already mentioned, Hollywood is run by white men. This is not exactly surprising, but possibly surprising is that the American film industry is the country's least diverse sector. It is less diverse than natural resources, than finance, than medicine, less diverse even than Donald Trump's cabinet was. And probably as a consequence of this, black talent has been systematically shut out of creator, director, and writer positions. Uh, this is all findings of the McKinsey study. Black actors receive fewer chances to succeed at every stage of their career than their white peers, regardless of their results. That black talent is in aggregate, often last in and first out, already represented uh, we're most vulnerable to industry market shocks. And there remain massive financial and social barriers to entry, which have outsized effects on members of the Black community. Um, and again, as a consequence, Black content receives smaller budgets, on average between 25 and 40% smaller, less marketing when those films do get made, on average about 5 to 15% less, and distribution in fewer international territories, on average about 30% fewer. 
In general business terms, the industry underinvests in product development, underinvests in product manufacturing, underinvests in marketing its products, and fails to make many of those products available in markets where demand very much exists. And I have to acknowledge at this point that there's probably an instinct here to think, well, if any business can lay claim to progressive values, specifically on diversity and inclusion, it must be Hollywood. It's the one place where, as they say, the only color that matters is green. And believe me, I've heard that many, many times throughout my career, but that simply isn't the case. What McKinsey finds is that despite that underinvestment, despite that under support, despite that under distribution, black content actually delivers a 10% better ROI than equivalent white content. And most remarkably, the aggregate cost of the industry's anti-black bias likely exceeds $10 billion every year. And that's roughly 7% off the industry's $148 billion current annual revenue. And I think it's important that we remember here, this is only anti-Black bias. It says nothing of the financial cost of similar dynamics affecting other historically underrepresented communities of all racial, gender, and disability backgrounds. In short, it's a lot of money. And obviously that's the cost that attracted the most attention in the New York Times and myriad financial and Hollywood industry publications. But there was an underreported conclusion, an underreported cost, uh, not just to the industry, but to everyone. And, and I'll quote it here, uh, both on and off screen, black talent is pigeonholed and funneled to race related content, which often plays into stereotypes. Now, of course, this isn't exactly news to anyone who has watched a Hollywood movie or television show going back to Hollywood's first ever blockbuster, Birth of a Nation, uh, a lost cause epic that not only solidified in white America's imagination the view of black men as criminal predators, it also rebirthed the Ku Klux Klan and gifted them the iconography, the burning crosses, the white robes that they deployed in a resurgence that left thousands of black people hanging from trees throughout the United States. Unless you think that Hollywood couldn't possibly continue to misrepresent black people as criminal threats more than 100 years later, a 2016 Vox study found that 64% of on-screen gang members were black, while a Justice Department study concluded five years prior found that only 35% of gang members in America were. I imagine that it's not also news to anyone that the stories that we tell each other influence the way in which we see the world, each other, and ourselves especially when those stories are told in literally every form from 40 feet to four inches high and distributed around the world instantaneously. The uh, 17th century Scottish poet Andrew Fletcher famously said, let me write the songs of a nation and who will will make its laws. And that idea uh, that material world lives downstream from culture is one so old that it's often misattributed to Plato. Is it at all surprising then that the casual murders of black people, both those captured in, on smartphones and the many more that preceded the smartphone era are often predicated on the perception of us as violent and criminal threats? Should we be at all shocked at the chillingly broad chorus of Americans chanting build the wall when half of Latino immigrant characters are shown on television engaged in criminal activity? This despite the fact that countless studies suggest that immigration and specifically Latinx immigration coincide with decrease in neighborhood crime rates. We can be genuinely surprised by the ongoing revelations of the Me Too movement in the context of the stories that Hollywood has told about women and male female relationships or at the life expectancy of trans black women when we consider how they've been represented in the stories that we share with each other when their stories have been acknowledged at, when those stories have acknowledged their existence at all. And I imagine at this point that I sound like a bit of a bummer and undeniably that's a lot of bad news about the state of Hollywood and additionally a reminder about the not so great state of the world, but it also presents an extraordinary opportunity. What the McKinsey study and many like it, including those from the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative at USC and UCLA's Bunch Center also show us is that because of the industry's historical and contemporary failures on these fronts, there are myriad paths to do well by doing good. Or put another way, taking a whole lot of money off the table as a result of good corporate decision-making. And though Hollywood is certainly a specific industry, something McKinsey highlights particularly in regards to its highly interdependent value chain and transfer of agencies and unions and the contract nature of work, I'm reasonably certain those opportunities exist in other sectors as well, especially when one looks at the inevitably and increasingly interdependent nature of all businesses, the communities in which they exist and the customers they may serve. 
The past McKinsey has set forward probably won't be unfamiliar to many of you who've thought about these questions in your own work. Setting intersectional diversity targets throughout organizations in the industry, expanding recruiting beyond traditional top tier universities, refining job criteria to better reflect the potential for success in our organizations, and tying executive comp uh, compensation to uh, success in all of these realms. And here's the thing. Uh, throughout my two decades in the industry and throughout the time of anyone in the industry who's inquired about these things, we've always heard one principal justification for not doing more. It would cost too much and it would earn too little. But what's clear now is that that actually couldn't be further from the truth. And I think we all know it. Like with many issues, when it comes to ongoing failure, time is money, a lot of money and a whole lot more. When it comes to Hollywood specifically, inclusion isn't costly, exclusion is. And that I think inevitably begs a few questions. How much longer will corporate boards and shareholders tolerate these suboptimal, frankly, almost laughable financial outcomes that have been sort of driven by an overwhelmingly white male status quo? And maybe more importantly, are the people who brought us to this moment, are many of you who have brought us to this moment, the people best suited to capture all of the value that's available to be had. Because the truth is, it's been there all along. That value is not new. The dirty little secret of the McKinsey study and its origins is that all along, I and the Blacklist Collective and probably every Black person in Hollywood was already aware of what they would find. The underinvestment, the under support, the money left on the table, the potential solutions. We just knew that our analysis had been ignored for many of the same reasons that the endemic issues is existed in the first place. And we hoped that people would listen to McKinsey because they are hardly woke social justice warriors who would directly benefit from the, stating these conclusions directly. But all of you have people you work with or who work for you or who are your customers who could tell you the same about your companies and your industries. Maybe they went to Harvard Business School, maybe they didn't. Maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't. Maybe they're your greatest critic. Will you seek them out? Will you encourage them to speak the truth as they know it? Will you listen when they do? And maybe most importantly, will you elevate them to positions befitting their true value, positions that suit the value that they can create for you, for your companies, and frankly, for all of us? I for one hope you do. I'll be better off for it. And I suspect all of us will be too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franklin, for those powerful and sobering insights about the cost of anti-Black bias, the cost of exclusion. It's a real financial cost, but more importantly, a social and human cost. Thank you also for highlighting the opportunity to shift mindsets and behaviors to create shared value, not just in the film industry, but for all sectors, all of our industries. What a great way to close this session on economic inclusion. I'm coming away with a lot of great learning. And one thing that's particularly resonating with me is something that um, Darren Walker from Ford Foundation said that hope is the oxygen of our democracy. We're the only nation that has the word dream attached to it. And it's for that American dream that my parents immigrated to this country from South Korea. 